imagine how beautiful must have been this square with all these monumental arches covered with travertine and all these statues and beautiful fountains spilling out water, reflecting the light on the travertine. So we might think about this more like the way we think today about Lincoln Center. Exactly. With fountains in the middle and gleaming mm -hmm. stone. Well, should we start off by talking a little bit about the structure and how it yes. was built? Well, you have to imagine the Colosseum as a gigantic donut. You have the inside, that's the arena. Arena originally Latin meant sand. On the floor where gladiators were fighting, they used sand to absorb blood and body fluids, you know, like a gigantic cat litter, if you think about it. So between different fights, they could simply clean off very easily. The original name of this building was not Colosseum. Colosseum is a nickname given later, not because it was a colossal monument, but it, because it was located in the proximity of a colossal statue, originally of Nero that was part of his, the decoration of his house. And so with time, the nickname was given with, by this proximity. The original name was actually Flavian Amphitheater. And this is something very typical even if you think about American monuments. You have the Lincoln Center, you have the Rockefeller Center. They are connected with the name of the family that paid for the building. The Flavian family paid for the building of the Colosseum. Flavian Amphitheater is just a technical name for the shape. It simply means in Greek a double theater. The original Greek theaters were actually semicircles Semicircle. with a flat end by the stage, and so this is really just fitting those two together. By using arches and concrete, Romans were able to build an amphitheater, so even a double theater with seats on a flat surface. The engineering behind it, it's absolutely astonishing, considering that it was only built in 10 years. The Colosseum could hold between 50,000 and 80,000 people, and if you look at the actual top part of each of the ground floor arches, you see a Roman number. They are very dark and ah, dilapidated. I see. You can see a 23, and then there's a 24, and then there's a 25. They are progressive. And this number would have been written on the chicken given to the people. It's like in modern stadium. You would have a assigned seat. A gate number. Also the seat, because it was extremely important for the Romans. In the seats were assigned according to their status. Right. So you had the most important people close to the arena, and the least important being the women on the top floor. Here you actually see the style of the Colosseum. So you have three story of arches, and then another story, a fourth floor with windows. So it's closed with small windows inside it. And if you look at these arches, the arches are framed by columns. At the bottom part, you have what's called Tuscanic. It's similar to Doric, but it's more a local, a, a, an Italic style. It's even, even a little simpler than Doric, it seems. Yeah, it's also the base. I mean, Doric columns do not have a base, while right. uh, um, Tuscanic columns do have a base. And they're not fluted no. as well. Yeah. Right. Then you go to the Ionic columns under the second story, and the Ionic columns actually are, they were considered the most feminine of the columns, because their proportions were more slender and with these volutes on the top. And the women sat high. Exactly. As well. yeah. Yeah. On the top floor, you got the Corinthian. They're based on the acanthus plant, and it's indigenous in Rome. You can find it in many gardens. It's, like, it's very nice with these green leaves. And so it's an imitation of a piece of stone covered with leaves of grass. Inside of each of the arches, on the second and third floor, there would be a statue. And on the top floor, there would be probably bronze shields on top alternating the windows. Again, we imagine the Colosseum as a donut. The outside circle was done with blocks of travertine. The inside of the donut was done with a core of concrete. Ancient Romans had really perfected concrete yeah. and really were the first to use it as this real structural material. And that was critical for their ability to create structures of this size. Also something like the Pantheon. Mm -hmm. The development of concrete was crucial uh, for two main reasons. The first one is, if you work with cut stone, marble, travertine, even tufa stone, you need specialized workers because you need to know how to cut a stone. If you get it the wrong way, the stone will crumble into your hand, right? With concrete, it makes it possible for non-specialized workers to produce something that's more sturdy. At the same time, it's less expensive, you know, you, to query blocks of marble, it's not the cheapest. Concrete could be assembled everywhere. You, could, you just need a little mortar and few pieces of stone to make it aggregate and water. So it's very easy, but at the same time, it's more elastic. With concrete, you get this sort of elasticity and the idea that you can mold the space because it's something liquid and you can simply mold it the way you want it. 
And so the idea would be to take a wooden framework mm -hmm. that framed out the space that you wanted and then to pour concrete into that wooden mold. Exactly. And then it would be then would be covered with the decoration. It could be uh, bricks, stuck or whatever you want. So, so it really allowed for far more monumental structures mm -hmm. and uh, that, that would then be economically and physically feasible. And, and uh, less expensive and quick. You know, 10 years to build the Colosseum is quite an accomplishment because they use mostly concrete. And also kind of thinking about architecture mm -hmm. in a new way mm -hmm. in terms of shaping space. an interior space. Particular interiors, because if you look at Greek architecture, you look at the temples, the inside of the temples is quite narrow. If you think the Pantheon, you just are in this amazing right. sphere. Right. And that's what they really invented. They are molding not the outside, but inside, to be able to produce a vault that could permit to have a space free of standing columns in the middle right. to support the roof. Moving away from post and lintel to architecture an to an interior space. Which really, in a sense, almost doubled the, the architectural vocabulary and created a, an advancement over a system that had existed for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Romans, they employ concrete on a, such a scale that permitted them to build wherever they wanted. They were not forced by the space. Greeks could not build that here whenever they wanted. They needed a slope. So what if you were living in a city without slopes? No theater for you, right? Romans were able to create a theater or an amphitheater or a circus or a bath complex wherever they wanted. I mean, it's true that the Greeks seemed to use natural features and in a more passive way, whereas the Romans seemed to shape the landscape much more aggressively. You talked about the fact that there had been a lake here. Mm -hmm. Let's drain the lake. We're putting a building here. Mm -hmm. That is, nature becomes in the service of man rather than vice versa. That's actually a very good point. The fact is that uh, they wanted to be able to shape their space. Yeah. So the idea of urban planning, that we you could build the city the way you wanted to and not just be subject to the landscape that was there. But I think that there's this really important way in which the Romans are thinking of themselves as powers in the landscape, having that sort of dominance. I mean, it's, it seems to me that the Rome is shaped in a way that speaks of that notion of their own inherent strength. What was different about the Roman society, they were not racist in the sense they were looking at the color of your skin. They didn't care less about that. It was a multicultural society. I mean, there were Romans from Africa, Romans from Turkey, Romans from Germany. What made it different was were you a citizen or not? If you were not a citizen, you were nobody. But if you were a citizen, the color of your skin was not important. But, but there were fine distinctions even within citizenship. Exactly. Of course, there were social classes. What inter an interesting aspect was that you could move along the social scale. While for Greeks, if you, you could not even acquire citizenship, it was extremely rare to obtain citizenship. For the Romans, even a slave could become first a free man and then his children would become full citizen for Rome. It's like the American. I mean, if you think about America, like second generation immigrants, as the same idea. They realized that this, being able to move and being able to sort of give people a chance in life could make all the difference in, in the economy.